Without further ado, let me introduce our keynote speaker, uh, and I also will prevail upon you to take this moment to silence your cell phones, please. Uh, among the foremost authorities in the world of an, on Impressionism and French painting of the period 1830 to 1930, Richard Robson Brutel, better known as Rick, holds three degrees from Yale University and has taught at the University of Texas, Northwestern University, the University of Chicago, Yale, and Harvard. He is currently Vice Provost of the University of Texas at Dallas, as well as the Margaret McDermott Distinguished Chair of Art and Aesthetic Studies in the Interdisciplinary Program in Arts and Humanities at the University of Texas in Dallas, and the Founding Director of the Edith O'Donnell Institute of Art History, which is housed at UT Dallas and the Dallas Museum of Art. In 2014, Rick was charged with creating an art institute of the future, linking new technologies, sciences, and the arts, supported by gifts from Edith O'Donnell and the state of Texas. More than a decade ago, he had established the, CS, the CISM, or Center for Interdisciplinary Study of Museums, also at UT Dallas, with a grant from the Elizabeth and Felix Rowaton Foundation. Rick is director of this center and the instigator of two important projects there. The first is the Yale series in the history and theory of art museums, and uh, the other is uh, Rick uh, serving as the director of the Paul Gauguin uh, catalog raisonné for the Wildenstein Institute in Paris that was uh, named Commandateur des Arts et des Lettres by the French Minister of Culture for his work for Frame. The French, wait a minute, I have Frame somewhere else here. I'll get back to that. <laughs> I was rearranging things. There's a lot that Rick has done. <laughs> it's hard to keep track of it all. Rick's museum career now began, as you heard from Ian, uh, when he was appointed the Searle Curator of European Painting at the, Institute, uh, at the Art Institute of Chicago, where he oversaw the renovation and reinstallation of European paintings and sculpture galleries. In 1988, he became the McDermott Director of the Dallas Museum, for which he raised support for and, for and completed the Hammond building that opened in 1993. Since leaving the Dallas Museum in 1993, Rick has involved numerous other museum projects in Memphis, Portland, Oregon, Canberra, Australia. And ever in demand, he has also served as advisor for the Clement Greenberg Archive in Portland. We would be here till the wee hours, I promise you, were I to name all of Rick's distinguished publications. So here is a small selection of titles. Pizarro's People, From the Private Collections of Texas, The Robert Lehman Collection, 19th and 20th Century Paintings, Gauguin Impressionism, Impressionism Painting Quickly in France, 1860 to 1900, and the book that first put him on my radar screen in 1984, A Day in the Country, Impressionism and the French Landscape, for which he was awarded a Chevalier in the Order of Arts and Letters by the French government. Rick has served on the boards of directors of many national cultural organizations, and until 2010, he worked with Elizabeth and Felix Roatin, former ambassador to France, and Françoise Cachin, former director of the French National Museums, to direct FRAME, I told you I'd get back to FRAME, the French Regional American Museum Exchange, which is a coalition of 12 French and 12 American regional museums. Rick has also advised the State Department on its developing programs in the area of cultural exchange involving Africa, Asia, and the Americas, and he was the founding board director of the McKinney Avenue Contemporary in uh, Dallas and the Dallas Architecture Forum. This afternoon, Rick will open our symposium, framing the issues that will be expanded by others today and tomorrow, and I understand he's juggled his title just a little bit, so I'll let him explain that to you. And in the meantime, I hope you will join me in welcoming Rick Brutel, who we are honored to have here as our keynote speaker. Um, the, it, I'm very nervous today because I gave my first public lecture in 1973 when I was a graduate student at Yale from this podium. It was the Frick Talks. And we all rehearsed, we had 20 minutes, and we rehearsed in front of our ever critical confreres at our universities, and each of the universities got one speaker, and I was the hapless Yale speaker. And it was about the high horizon line in French photography of the 1850s and 60s. Whatever prompted me to talk about that, I have no memory. 
but I was very nervous, and I'm, this is the second lecture I've given from that podium, so many years have intervened. You'll see what my title is. I was actually going to give an overview of Impressionist collecting from the beginnings in France throughout the world, and I thought, how boring. It's going to be a whole bunch of names and a whole bunch of places, and it's not going to be an interesting lecture. And so I thought, well, maybe we might get a book out of this, and so I can write a more interesting introduction to the book um, by talking about that subject rather than boring you with a lecture. So I'm actually going to talk about something I know about. Um, which is the private collecting in Chicago. And I have two colleagues who are going to talk about Bertha Palmer in subsequent lectures, and I don't want them to be nervous that I'm going to steal their thunder. I'm only going to steal a teeny bit of their thunder, not all of their thunder. Uh, because I'm really talking about how what we consider to be Impressionist painting nestled in larger collections with other kinds of works of art in different ways in two of the most important collections um, that form the basis of the Art Institute of Chicago, the Palmer Collection and the Ryerson Collection, and then a third collection which has this little fleeting teeny bit of Impressionism and then charge uh, uh, the next generation into post-impressionism. So I'm actually thinking about how impressionism fit into the history of art in one particular city. My two principal subjects, and you're going to see many of these portraits of Mrs. Potter Palmer uh, on the left um, by Zorn, a picture which is, I think, deeply hideous, but which was commission from the other ladies of the Board of Lady Managers of the 1893 exhibition and by a great artist and then a really wonderful portrait by a not very great artist um, of Martin Ryerson. His name, the painter's name was Louis Betts and you can get an instant PhD if you can tell me who Louis Betts was. Um, but he ma made a fantastic portrait of Martin Ryerson, and I'm contrasting the two of them. Here are their houses in Chicago, the Palmer Castle, not a mere house, not a mansion, but castle on the left, which was on uh, what's now Lakeshore Drive in the north side of the city, and the Martin Ryerson house by two architects I've also never heard of named Treat and Foltz, um, but who designed a sober and very beautiful um, Richardsonian Romanesque um, house, which still stands um, in Chicago. And you can see immediately that even though these houses were built in the same decade, the 1880s, they have very different ideas of what constitutes a house and what the relationship between interior and exterior is with Mrs. Potter Palmer's house with all of its turrets and staircases and contrasting colors of stone and whatever sort of bristling um, with a kind of offensive um, play and Mr. Um, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Ryerson's house rather more subtle, a little further back from the street, monochromatic, um, much less assertive. Now, what's interesting is that one of them um, lived on the south side of Chicago, which was where the big money of the 19th century, the earlier part of the century was, and it's down here. And the other one lived in what is now the wealthiest part of Chicago, but was then a kind of middle class area of the city. And Mrs., uh, Miss, Mr. and Mrs. Potter Palmer built their huge house in the wrong part of town. And of course, town went where they went. Um, this is a, they were both involved in the Chicago plan of Daniel Burnham after the 1893 World's Fair. And what's interesting is that Martin Ryerson was a trustee not only of the Art Institute, but also of, of the university that became the University of Chicago. And here one sees it here on the south side. This is where the World's Columbian Exhibition was. And Drexel Drive, where his house was, was within walking distance of the university. So he's associated not with down town, not with banking, not with power, but with the university, with knowledge. She lived up here, what became um, the part of the city that sort of takes the lake in. Uh, Chicago ignored the lake um, until really into the well into the 20th century. And Mrs. Potter Palmer was one of the first who built an important house on the lake. 
You see again, I, I like the a slide on the left because it's when the house was brand new with the most contrast between the two stones, the rusticated and the smooth. And even though it's by a great architect, you sort of wish he hadn't designed it. And then the Martin Ryerson house on the other side. And to, I want to go through the interiors to show you how different these people were. Mrs. Potter Palmer's staircase on the left with its lions and it's this and it's that and it's huge um, d uh, ways down and all of its ornament and Martin Ryerson's on the side much more sober, much simpler, much more with works of art. Their libraries, it's sort of hard to find the books in the Potter Palmer Library because they're con completely overwhelmed by carved mahogany and oak and paintings and furniture and here is the library um, in, the, in uh, Martin Ryerson's house filled with works of art that d wouldn't suggest that this man was interested in Impressionism. The living rooms, again, a study in contrast, one a kind of bourgeois show place with every bibelot and piece of furniture you can imagine, and the other very sober, very quiet, very thoughtful with a Renoir over the fireplace and a Redon over here, and Chinese porcelain and contemporary American furniture. Their dining rooms, you know, here's Mrs. Potter Palmer's dining room with totally over the top everything, and here's the Ryerson dining room where you could, their largest dinner party was six people. So they thought that intimate conversation and real conversation, oftentimes with university people and capitalists together at the same dinner, was much more rewarding than show, than having the right people in town and from out of town in a showy dining room. Bertha Honoré Palmer, Mrs. Potter Palmer, and she wasn't Potter Palmer, his name was Potter and her name was Bertha. And she's oftentimes called Mrs. Potter Palmer, and people think that that was her name. Potter was her husband's name, and she was really Mrs. Palmer, not Mrs. Potter Palmer. She's born in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, she's a beautiful young girl, grew up bilingually. Her fr family, Honoré, obviously had French blood. Um, she'd married this rather dashing um, young man named Potter Palmer and became a kind of wife who controlled very much his own social destiny, who was really in charge of many of the things in the family, who she was a clothes horse. She had spectacular jewelry. She did great parties. You know, he aged and she didn't um, until he died. And he dies in 1901. Um, they were married in 1871, so they're only married for 30 years. They have four children. And the placement of the children and the way that the family fits into society are all very important um, to her. She also was really interested in Florida and was one of the first Chicagoans who had extensive real estate in Florida. In fact, a lot of the family fortune after she dies comes from Florida real estate, not from paintings. Her big moment came with the 1893 World's Columbian Exhibition. Um, and this painting of Queen Bertha um, was painted, was commissioned from the Board of Lady Managers of the World's Fair, of which she was the chair, um, to record her queenly presence at the time. And it's fascinating to sort of think of the allegorical woman in the middle of the water in the fair and this you know, living and breathing queen um, by, uh, by uh, Zorn. What's fascinating is the role that she played and that therefore that women played in the World's Fair of 1893. This is sort of the conventional role of women in most World's Fairs before 1893. Ladies, 40 ladies from 40 nations and you go in and judge which one is the prettiest in this horrible display and this was the building that she was responsible for raising the money for and chairing the committee and building, the woman's building. It was a building designed by a woman architect with paint, everything in the building was made by a woman, everything in the building. So it was the first really important women's power building um, in any international exhibition, and it was right here in the fair, at the end of the Plaisance and on um, the Great Lakes. This is, was the Fine Arts Building, now the Palace of the Museum of Natural History, and here one sees it. 
Here was its great interior space. And imagine going into this place in 1893 and thinking that every scientific invention, every machine, every painting, every piece of furniture, everything in this room was designed by a woman. And the paintings at the end, um, the one on one end, which is called Ancient Women, um, is by um, uh, Mary McMonies. And the one on the other hand, now lost, um, is by uh, Mary Cassatt, two Marys. And of course, we see the president, uh, Mrs. Pa Palmer, up here, and the architect, um, the first woman architect who graduated from MIT Architecture School who designed the building. And this idea of women contributing to the core of society and having a building that was on the, the most important real estate in the World's Fair. Now, the problem with all of this is that Mrs. Potter Palmer, Mrs. Bertha Palmer, not being a man, could not be on a single board of a cultural institution in Chicago. So she became one of the most important donors to the Art Institute of Chicago, but as Mrs. Potter Palmer, and the donation was the Potter Palmer donation. No Mrs., no Bertha, none of this stuff that indicates woman. Um, and so she's essentially emasculated, um, defeminized by being part of it. And she went from the Art Institute being in this sort of rather sober Richardsonian Romanesque building to this building which was replaced um, by the building for the Art Institute in 1892-93. Her house was amazing, but she realized in the late 1880s that she was collecting on such a scale, and you'll learn a lot about the rapidity of that and how it worked for, in a later lecture, that she built her own picture gallery. And here you see it behind the house with its own entrance. So it could be opened, like many of the galleries in New York um, at the same period of time, independently of the house. One could run the house and do it, and here is her gallery. And it was this room chock-a-block with pictures, um, carpets, pieces of furniture, uh, uh, things everywhere. There were at one point more than 180 pictures hanging in the room at one time, and you could bring in paintings and put them on easels for particular lectures. Um, it was skylit. It had all the walls were covered with pictures. And it was based on this kind of idea of a picture gallery, which was um, done earlier in um, Minneapolis by James J. Hill. And uh, the great, the, the great Duranwell um, was the man who, who advised him on the skylight systems and the arrangement of paintings. And Mrs. Potter Palmer, knowing this, did one better. And here again, with the poor leopard, and I guess the implication is that she shot it, but we don't know that, and there's another one over here, and who knows who shot it, with these long sofas that people would kill for in the Frick Gallery, if they'll, there are only those two sofas you can sit on, and they're very prime real estate, and she had many of them here. And this is what's interesting, and this is what I want to talk about. This was the picture gallery around 1890, and you see one Monet here, and you look into this room and you see paintings by Millet and Corot and Daumier and Daubigny and Cazin, a whole group of artists who were not Impressionist and with wonderful Delacroix. But during the 1893 exhibition, this is how she rehung the room. She took down all those rows of paintings, all of that old-fashioned mid-century Barbizon stuff, and built an entire gallery only with Monet, Renoir, Pizarro, and Degas, loaning the rest of her pictures um, to the exhibition at the World's Fair and giving party after party after party in this room. So going from Corot, Delacroix, Millet to Monet, Renoir, Pizarro, is this huge change that happened it, at, between 1889 and, and, and 1890, and you'll hear all about it later on. She had incredible 
incredible Delacroix, like really great Delacroix, one of the most important Coro figure pictures along with nine other figure pictures, um, pictures by deeply unfashionable artists. Now this is by Daniel Bouveret. He actually needs a dissertation, but I'm sure nobody's going to write it. Um, wonderful Millet pictures, um, fantastic Millet landscape, lots of Coros, a big late Daubigny salon pictures. These are the kind of pictures that were in some ways a dime a dozen in American collectors in Boston and Philadelphia and New York and in Minneapolis. But she gave way to this to this new world, and you're going to learn about what year she bought what and from whom, maybe even how much she paid in a later lecture, but it's a big change. And these paintings replaced those paintings, which were, in a way, a dime a dozen in America, and two great Manets, one in which, you know, the viewer has to run for his life because he's going to be about cut down by the horses, another with these long, wonderful strokes of paint, um, one of his earliest um, 1868 picture with Camille um, in front of the water, fantastic pictures of the Mediterranean, you'll see even more. Her Renoir, she loved Renoir. And in fact, the two little circus girls, which she owned, she had a special leather carrying case for her eight favorite pictures, which she took with her all over the world. She installed them in her hotel suites in London and Paris. And so these peak pictures traveled with her, and this one was the pride, pride of place very good Pizarro's, and she, Pizarro spoke um, creditable English, and so Mrs. Potter Palmer spoke good French, but it was a relief occasionally to speak English. Fantastic Degas, both oil um, and uh, pastels, and then Monet after Monet after Monet after Monet, and you'll see this Monet twice in this lecture, and I'll explain why in a minute. What's interesting is that she owned in her lifetime at least 100 paintings by Monet. And she sold as, you know, she sold 50% of them as she continued to buy and create her collection more vividly. But she had even more paintings by Jules Cazin. And what always happens with collectors is their wisdom is celebrated, but not their stupidity. So you don't remember that she also had 112 paintings in her life by Jules Cazin, but you do remember that she had all of these Monets. Now let's go into an Impressionist collection that fits into a completely different category. Here is Martin Ryerson, his father, Martin A. Ryerson um, was a timber merchant, and after the big Chicago fire of 1871, he cleaned up because he provided all the lumber for the new construction. His son, um, who inherits his father's money, only child, inherits his, his uh, Martin and Antoine Ryerson, who was born in 1850, 1856 and dies in 1932. When his father died in 1887, he was the richest man in Chicago, and that was saying a lot, because there were a lot of rich men in Chicago in 1887. He becomes very distinguished, this picture, and wonderful photographs of him. He lived in this house, which still stands on the south side of Chicago. It's very, if you want to go visit it, it's very near the Obama's house. He might shudder to think that, but I don't know. Um, and then rather than going to Florida, had his country place um, near, near Chicago at Lake Geneva in southern Wisconsin. And his best friend, this was his house, and his best friend was this guy named Charles Hutchinson, who I'll tell you a little bit about in a minute. Here are the Ryersons and the Hutchinsons in the late 1880s. They were each very well married, all in love with each other, both not improperly, but properly, um, traveled together, were equally rich, and neither of the couples ever had children. So there is this sense in which they were devoted to their, um, their uh, civic causes and to art. Hutchison was the chairman of the board of the Art Institute from 1884 to 1904. So during the years when the new building was built, and his richer friend was on the board and was the prime collector. Um, Hutchison 
was rich, he was a Unitarian, showing that he was a free thinker, and he built this completely hideous pile for the Unitarian church in south, on the south side, and lived in Prairie Avenue in this, with this rather French house, and was a collector who you wouldn't want to really talk about. Um, his most important thing was this weird Rossetti, the only one in the Art Institute, and then these ghastly paintings that were supposed to be by Halls and Rembrandt and famous artists, and even all of us can see in looking at them that they aren't right. His only good pictures were by Netcher and Teniers, and you can contrast even Ryerson, who didn't like Dutch pictures, but who did much better in buying them than his friend Hutchison. The two traveled a lot together. They went all over the world. They were unencumbered by children. They didn't need nannies. Um, they traveled with real style. Here they are in India together. And this is a photograph, which is a fascinating photograph, because in 1921, Ryerson, who was then chairman of the board of the Art Institute of Chicago, went to visit Monet and offered Monet $1 million, $1 million in 1921 um, for Chicago to buy the great water Lily's pictures that are now in the Orangerie. And Monet, not thank God for Chicago, but thank God for France, said no. The Ryerson's house was filled with works of art, it was a place that was deeply contemplative, and it was not filled at least ostensibly with modern art. And here you see the staircase again, sort of rather mediocre portraits of the, pa of the couple. American paintings, um, quite a number of American paintings, which Mrs. Potter Palmer didn't like because American art wasn't good. Fantastic old master pictures, furniture, um, lots of ceramics. Um, this is again the study looking on one side and then on the other and then with the furniture and books, and I'm not going to identify all the paintings, but looking at this house, you can see that this man thought about the history of art, not about a particular school or national style. In the dining room, you can see the only painting that you see in this only photograph of the dining room is by Winslow Homer. And so an art, a, 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 a collector who is both wise enough to collect European contemporary art and American contemporary art, something that Mrs. Potter Palmer didn't do in this beautiful thing with the Renoir um, at the piano and this fantastic, now not, no longer in the collection, painting by Redon, a great um, Monet, which the collection doesn't own anywhere, and which came from, guess who, Mrs. Potter Palmer. So when she deaccessioned it, he bought it. He, had, he knew the history of European easel pictures. He had gold grand pictures. And what his most, his real interest was in narrative, in sequences of related pictures by one artist that told a story, and told the story in a way in which you could retell it when you were having a party or a guest. And this is the great Giovanni Di Paolo um, sequence of paintings of the life of John the Baptist, which might have been the box for this. John the Baptist um, by, who's it by, sorry, Donatello. Then this sequence of paintings by the master of Amiens with saints and narrative scenes of the life of Christ also shown. It, it is said that he hung sometimes one at a time and other times had them hung in a room so that the story could be told or the figures could be identified. These Boutinone pair, fantastic Perugino, um, a series of, 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 of predella panels of the life of Christ. He also liked northern paintings. He liked Italian paintings. He liked French um, paintings, the master of the Moulin and Greg Clouet. He was very interested. He read his Goncourt in the relationship between Renoir and the Impressionist and 18th century painting. And even though his Vato turned out not to be a Vato, um, he was more fascinated with the relationship between Vato and Renoir than he was in the authenticity of his Vato. This fantastic series of Goyas, which are as hilarious if I was to tell you the story as they look like they are. And of course, what did they lead him to buy this? So you have the interplay between Goya and Manet in the house of a collector. And he was fascinated. He loved to talk about the relationship between Proudhon, who would think of talking about Proudhon and Renoir today, none of us. But he actually saw these things with his pictures. 
He was fascinated by the Dutch origins of Impressionism in the paintings of Jean Kind, and his Renoirs are simply to die. And there is a very large group of them, wonderful still lifes, and then the Monets, this fantastic 1874 picture of the garden, uh, one of the greatest and one of the earliest American acquisitions of the Gare saint Lazare, given by him, one of the greatest of Monet's still lifes, very rare. Uh, he painted very few of them. And then this is a haystack which he bought through an e intermediary from Mrs. Potter Palmer. So this is a picture which is now a Ryerson picture at the Art Institute, but it could well have been a Potter Palmer picture. He had really great late um, uh, Monets, and he had them in quantity. And you can see here this whole group of them. The, my favorite one, this, because it, what, this is a pool of liquid pale blue paint that was obviously poured onto the canvas when it was on the floor or a table and then allowed to dry. So there's this pool of blue with no horizon line. And he went one step further. He bought a truly great Cezanne and a truly great Gauguin. So Mrs. Potter Palmer ne never did this. She never went beyond Impressionism, but Ryerson went not only before, but after Impressionism. He also loved drawings and had a fantastic drawing cabinet and was one of the first subscribers um, of the series of color prints by Mary Cassatt, one of the greatest works of graphic art in all of human history. And both Mrs. Potter Palmer and Mr. Ryerson had them. He had incredible drawings by Redon and Cezanne and superb pastels um, by, uh, by Redon. You can see here's this picture which got away from him. He, both of them sold. And this is something that one has to remember about collectors. Collectors don't always keep everything from lot through life. They sell, and this picture sold, and this picture stayed with Mrs. Ryerson, who, who survived him after his death in 1832, and one sees it here, it's now in the Art Institute. He loves Sargent and Homer, and Sargent and Homer, both on paper um, and um, paintings, and he loved knowledge. The Ryerson Library, the Art Institute of Chicago, is one of the great art libraries in America. It's not quite the frick, I admit, but it's a good provincial variant of it, and it preserves his name. And this is where he's buried, in a tomb he built for his father, designed by Sullivan, with a theme, they'd been to Egypt. He'd been with his father and the Hutchinsons to Egypt um, in the early 1880s, and the tomb was designed in 1885, and it says Martin Ryerson, and of course it has both father and son. The third uh, collector I want to talk about is Frederick Clay Bartlett, born 1873, a little younger than the other, a flamboyantly gay, though married three times, um, man, who he's, and also a painter, with really bad taste. He had this you know, house on Prairie Avenue with his second wife, Helen Birch Bartlett, and you can see how uncertain his taste was and how difficult. He went a lot uh, back and forth with his sisters and his mother um, back and forth across uh, the Atlantic. When he married Helen Birch um, in the late 19 teens, he began to collect pictures, and he collected very seriously. She died in 1924. The collection came to the Art Institute in 1924. Two Gauguins, two great, um, you know, that isn't chopped liver and neither is this. I mean, he did incredibly well. He wanted so much The Boy in the Red Vest and it was out in Chicago, but it was $30,000 and he wouldn't pay the price and so he didn't get it. So this painting on the right, which is now in the National Gallery, was going to be in Chicago, if only he'd loosened his purse a little bit. And then this, his only Impressionist picture, which he bought in 1924 for $24,000, um, and was the second owner of the Grand Shot. And it's the only link between Impressionism because it was in the final Impressionist exhibition of 1886. And what's interesting is that 
after he um, bought it, Martin Ryerson took him out to his house to show him his Gauguin. And of course, Gauguin's remembering the Grand Jatte with this figure and this figure. And the two of them talked about how paintings talked with each other. Great Picasso, great Matisse, Hodler. I mean, who would have thunk that there were three Hodlers in an, in an American museum in 1924? They were always shown in a room together, painted white with white frames and some gilded simple frames that he was absolutely meticulous about. But in 1933, the year after Ryerson's death, Robert Harshi, who was the director of the Art Institute, did this huge exhibition in which he took down everything in the permanent collection of the Art Institute and replaced it with the greatest loan exhibition of European paintings ever done in America. It's like there should be a book about it. It's an unbelievable exhibition borrowed from all over the country to show what Americans had collected um, it, before 1933. And in 1934, he rehung the Art Institute's collection with a little bit of help from lenders. And here is the building. And what's riveting is that old master pictures are here, across here, and you sort of start in the Renaissance and you get to the 19th century. French 19th century is here, down through here. Then there are big pictures that related to nothing. And then American 19th century is here. So the, the idea of rereading the history of art with the Ryerson collection, the Potter Palmer collection, the Worcester collection, um, the Winterbotham collections, the collections that had come, uh, rearranging them in rooms that were no longer donor rooms. And you can see here's how Mrs. Potter Palmer is written out of all of this because she wasn't a man. And just read the list of the trustees. The incredible thing is in 1934, there was one Jew, which you know, no one, I, I don't know quite how they managed to do that at that time because Chicago was very anti-Semitic. And this man is everywhere because he was a man and she is nowhere, only her son succeeded her. But what happened is that when that exhibition was done and all the pictures from all of the collectors were taken out of rooms that were just for them. You went to the Potter Palmer room and three or four Ryerson rooms and a Hutchison room and a field room. It was all about collecting. And Robert Harsh, Harshi had the guts to make the museum be about art rather than about the people who owned the art. And when he took it down in 1934, only one collector insisted that his collection remain intact. And that was um, Frederick Clay Bartlett. And it, the, the fact that that collects the only collection room uh, that remains in the Art Institute. So you see in this lecture how Impressionism started as an outgrowth of mid-century French painting, how in another collection in Martin Ryerson, it took its cue from all the, from the whole history of art. It was sort of nestled in the entire history of both American and European art, and how in the other collector, it was like this very beginning in its most radical form of an art type called post-impressionism. So impressionist collection is never as simple as impressionism. It always fits into a larger contract, context, whether in the private collection or the museum. Thank you very much. Thank you.